faith. I'm just going to give you a thought tonight out of out of Isaiah chapter number 57 on our on our now series that I believe the Lord has impressed upon my heart as a um, kind of to go with the theme. And I, I'm just going to give this to you. Then we're going to watch something that always stirs my heart. We're going to watch a little little video. I I I. I usually watch this video at least once a month. It keeps me stirred up. And uh, just reminds me of how desperate we are in need uh, for revival. Isaiah chapter number 57. Of course, the book of Isaiah, to be honest, is it's not a very pleasant book. Uh, you read it. Of course, there's some parts of it that uh, we see the Savior. Isaiah, of course, was a prophet, but his whole job was to turn the nation of Israel back to God. Israel was full of idolatry. And, uh, Isaiah's message was repent, 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 turn. And uh, so uh, here in right smack dab in the middle of Isaiah, we see Isaiah chapter number 57. I want you to pick up in verse number 13. Here's our prayer for revival. Look at what Isaiah says in Isaiah 57 verse 13. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Boy, I love that. Verse 14. And shall say, Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Now notice this little phrase, to revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, Lord, just, just give a thought tonight. God, what's on my heart? Just open it on my heart tonight to show to our church that revival can happen, but it, can, it needs to happen now. Lord, we, we desperately are in need of a reviving in our homes. We need a reviving in our, in our own personal lives. Lord, we need a, humble, a humbleness in our nation. God, I believe it starts at the home. And Lord, I believe that leaks over into the church. And then I believe the church, of course, uh, Lord, will impact our communities. We can see a revival here on Harrison Bridge Road. And God, I believe that our city can see something happen right here because of our faith and our humility our brokenness. God, I pray that you would do that for us right now, Lord. We ask in desperation, please, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Revive now. That's the theme of this, really, this whole message tonight. And maybe a few messages in the next few weeks we're going to talk about now. We, we're going to deal with stewardship in the month of February because our faith promise is that month. And I feel like that would go good with our tithing and giving and our faith promise. And we could deal with all that. We did that last year and we've seen our offerings increase and we've seen our faith promise go up and we've just seen God do some great things in the month of January and February. My prayer is that we can get the year off on a good note with revive. Now we don't have a revival coming up uh, until May and uh, we don't have uh, the missions conference can I guess can be a revival for us and stir our hearts but but we're not we don't need a revival service if you will uh, what we need is a stirring in our hearts about God do something this year in my heart stir my heart now you know often in, in churches we get so we get so uh, uh, so enamored with what somebody else is doing and we get so, well, they need to hear. Boy, it had been good if they were here tonight because that message would have been for them. But how about us? It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Hey, I don't know about my brother, my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You say, why? Because we need revival and we need it now. You know, how many of us through the years have prayed Psalms 85 verse 6? We, we've heard it mentioned but how many of us has actually prayed that prayer, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? What a good prayer. Revive us again, Lord. Revive us again. God, revive. You know what the word revive means? To bring back something from the dead. I mean, something that was once dead, to bring it back. 
Hey, won't that be a prayer for us? Wilt thou not revive us again? In truth, we need revival. I know of really no greater need in our churches than that of revival. Folks, we, I'll be honest with you, we at Bible Baptist are blessed with, with, with a beautiful property. I don't know any other church property in America that has the potential uh, that this church has in the growth and the, I mean, it's just beautiful. We, uh, this city is growing and the, it's just, it's coming to us. There, there's no question about that. We're located right off of an interstate and, I mean, accessibility and just, I mean, a wonderful potential. We, we, we have no need there. I mean, God has been good to this church. We have a nice facility. Hey, God's good. We got a place we can come in and worship. And, and uh, sometimes we might, and, and, and God forgive us, but we might complain about it not being big enough or not enough space. And God forgive us because I'll be honest, there's a lot of churches that would love to have what we have. Amen. And we got to ask forgiveness and say, Lord, if this is the only building that we're ever in, the only, w it, God's been good to us. Amen. And so we, uh, there's no greater need that this church has than that of revival. No, no greater need. No greater need that your family has than that of revival. You say, well, preacher, my family right now needs a car. Uh, now needs a car. Yeah, I, Jacob the other night, he, he's running through a red light and somebody, or not a red light. <laughs> Jacob's running through a, a green light, I hope. And, and some boys ran through a red light and, and smashed his car all to pieces last night. He called me and uh, late and... Um, he said, Preacher, I've just been a wreck. I'm okay. Everybody else is okay. But my car is total. And, uh, you know, so, and I, and I was thinking about this. And, of course, it was good. That, you know, I was, it, it was good. It, it could have been really bad. And uh, just a red light, you know, thing there. And and uh, could have been awful. But, Jacob, you don't need a car more than you need revival. You know, he's without a car right now. And of course, insurance and all that will take care of that. But you think about this. Often we put things above our spiritual needs. Wow. Oh, I gotta have this. I gotta have a bigger house, and I gotta have a better paying job, and I need a car right now, and I need a job right now, and I, I realize some of those things are very important, and I'm not downplaying those, but folks, we are in desperate need of a reviving. I mean, we are in desperate. We don't know how bad it is, but you start thinking about, I mean, you start looking at the scriptures and see, and then you start reading some of these old books about the revivals of the past and what these people did to bring on revival. They prayed, they fasted, they, they, it cost them something. Many of them would stay up all night and pray and, and fast and hunger for God and it increased their faith. They believed, hey, out of that, the Welsh revival, the Fulton Street revival, the revivals of the past. By the way, churches were started out of that and homes grew out of that. A nation was birthed out of that. You say, preacher, what, what do we need? We need revival. We need a reviving. This is why uh, we should have a theme here, the, a word of revive. Revive us now, notice what it says. Uh, I'm encouraged when I read this verse because it assures us that God is willing to revive our hearts. Look at it again. Uh, look at verse number uh, 15 again. I love this verse, but it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. Notice what he says. I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contract. You know what he's telling us he'll do? He'll do this if we have what it takes. He said, I will dwell with you if, notice that, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I want you to give you three things right now, three things that will help us in the matter of revive now. Revive now. Number one, I want you to notice a holy focus or a revival focus. A revival focus. Notice what he says. Go back to that verse again. He says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. It's a focus. Hey, it's a holy focus. It's a revival focus. He said, I will dwell in the high and holy place. So as long as our focus is turned inward, we will not see revival. We need a fresh, not just a glimpse, but a focus of the holiness of God. We need a focus of the holiness 
of God. See, pride is the idolatry of self. The reason we don't see revival, everybody uh, tune in with me, tune in with me. The reason we don't see revival is of the reason because of pride. And pride is self-idolatry. We put ourselves above the holiness of God. See, we are so used to building up our kingdoms. We, we, we form our little kingdoms and everything's okay as long as you don't mess with my kingdom and this is mine. I built this. I did this. And you know what that is though? There's a lot of eyes in that. Instead of saying God did this and God did that and this is God's kingdom and I'm a kingdom builder and I, I want to I build the kingdom for God and want to help uh, establish and help uh, promote. And, and instead of building up God's kingdom, we are so guilty of building up our own kingdom and we get so enamored with pride in ourselves. As long as we have pride, church, we will not see revival. Pride is the number one said pride is the idolatry of self and until we give preeminence to Christ we will not have revival until we stop singing to get a pat on our back we will not see revival until we stop preaching to get uh, uh, maybe a, a rise out of the crowd or a signature out of a Bible or, or we get whatever a love offering or whatever people preach for can I tell you unless we do things for Christ we will not see revival. There needs to be a revival focus. Hey, can I ask you a question? Is your focus right tonight? Is your focus on inward things instead of outward things? Now, let me just say this. If you're looking at other people, that's not the answer either. The focus ought to be on Christ. It ought to be on Christ. Number two, not only a revival focus... Get, our, get it off of us and get it on the Lord. But how about this? How about a revival fellowship? A revival fellowship. Because look at the next part of that verse in Isaiah chapter 57, verse number 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Notice that. To revive the, the spirit of the humble... Notice, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. He says here, this fellowship, I will dwell in the high and holy place with Him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. We see a revival fellowship. See, this high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity whose name is holy, think about this, would desire to dwell with us. Literally, think about one that is holy. He's pure. He's righteous. He's, he's altogether lovely. He's magnificent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's the best. He's the greatest. He would want to dwell with you and me. I, folks, that is amazing. How humble that, that God would actually spend time with me. And by the way, He wants to. He wants to. You know what revival is about? Revival, we, this revival fellowship, yes, we ought to have a fellowship, not with just each other, we ought to have fellowship with God. Yeah. I mean, literally, get alone with God. Hey, how in the world can we have revival if we have not talked to the one that's holy and high and lifted up? That's right. Who would actually take... Hey, I've spent uh, some time with some amazing people before. I love spending time with my family. I love spending time with my wife. And I actually got to, last night, me and her had a date for the first time in about two months. And it was nice. Hey, I love it. I love spending time with my wife. I love spending time with, 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 with our church. And I don't get to, a lot of times, individually spend the time with people. A lot of folks coming. I wish I got that individual time. There's not enough time in the week and in the, the year to do it. But I love, I love fellowship time. We get to go out here and just fellowship and talk. I love it. I've got to spend some time with some preachers that I, I, I just admire and love and look to. But they ain't never been someone that I've ever spent time with that's been more precious than that of our, our Savior and our God. Man, I love spending time with Him. My heart burns at times and I'm humbled at the fact that God would actually spend time with me. It ought to humble us. 
It ought to humble us. It ought to break us that how wicked we are and how great He is and how lowly we are and how high He is and how uh, just wonderful He is and how sorry we are. But yet God, listen, when He sees us, He sees the blood of His Son. There's the fellowship. The fellowship's in the blood. Amen. And we, he, he loves us because, hey, He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, to die for us. He, he loves us. And guess what? That ought, to, that ought to just do something for us. And we want to spend time with Him and say, Lord, we ought to be on our way to hell. But the grace of God, hey, thank God that for grace that we could fellowship with a, a God that's so wonderful. We ought to just spend time with Him. What brings about this revival? It brings about a focus, a revival focus. It also brings about a revival fellowship. And I, I do. I, I enjoy the fellowship of God's people. But there's no fellowship that I enjoy more than that of our Savior. And we ought to just fellowship with Him. Have some time to, in your day to fellowship with the Lord. And when we are filled with ourselves, we need no we have no need for God and we do not walk in the dependence on Him. Uh, friend, if we are filled with self, I believe a lot of problems that people have in life, uh, a lot of problems are brought on by us. We bring on a lot of our own problems and, and we get, uh, if you're not careful, sometimes we'll become a victim and we, we become pride-filled and we, we look at me, everybody, I've got problems. Well, join the club, we all got problems. And if we, if we just sat in here at times and we just stood up and started dwelling on our problems, we would literally be in here the rest of the month just talking about all of our problems. But guess what? When we stop dwelling on us and start dwelling on Him, everything starts getting a lot better. Amen? Because He is the problem solver. And He's the one that can bring about a revival. He can revive that cold heart that you have right now. I heard somebody the other day Say, preacher, pray for me. I've been cold for some time. You know what? Who can? I can't do anything about that. I could preach a message that, folks. I, I could maybe preach a message like J. Harold Smith or or like a, a, like a, a B. R. Lakin or like a Oliver B. Green. Some of these old men of the past and uh, that had the power of God. But even them, they could not on their own break that cold heart that you have. It has to be the power of God. Man, sometimes our heart gets cold because we see... Listen, there are some of you sitting in here tonight that you grew up in a very bad situation. I mean, you grew up in a very bad situation. There was mental abuse. There was physical abuse. There was sexual abuse. You were left. You were walked out on. You were despised. You were rejected. And all these things have carried uh, just a coldness in your life the whole time. And guess what? Now that you've got some age on you, it's starting to reveal itself even more. And let me tell you, if there's not a revival in your life soon, you'll become a very bitter person. Who can break up that ground, that coldness in your life? The Lord can. Now you can choose to carry that to the grave or you can choose to be better and have revival in your spirit. And then lastly, can I say not only just a revival fellowship and a revival focus, but how about a revival future? A revival future. Notice what he says in verse 15 again. He said, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. See, revival is new life. Think about it. It's new life. Something that was dead is now alive. Something that was once passed away has now been brought back. It is not something that is manufactured, but something that God gives. Something, in fact, that is He delights in giving. Matter of fact, He wants to send revival. He wants to send it. Hey, Bible Baptist, God wants to send revival here. Now. He wants it now. He wants it for your home. He wants it for my home. He wants to see. And see, we've had little trickles of revival for, a, for a quite some time. We've had a revival spirit and a revival joy at times. And God's doing and He's working. But we've only had just a little glimpse. Could you imagine what would happen if all of us got hungry and thirsty? Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
Can you imagine what God could do? He wants to send revival. Revival is a new life. It's something that we uh, do not manufacture, but something that God actually gives. And when God brings revival to a heart, there is no need to pump up that individual for things for God. There's no need to have a one, two, three, uh, let's do some jumping jacks and get all excited for God and, and woo and glory to God. Hey, there's no need for all that. That actually is a product of revival. We're not manufacturing anything up in here. Hey, I'm not wanting somebody to come in here and do a bunch of manufacturing and let's, uh, let's just stay in here until God does something. No. Friend, when God's in something, you don't have to do that. Things just start happening because God's actually bringing it. When does God blow upon His people? And upon whom? He says here in verse 15 of Isaiah 57, He says, For thus saith the High and Holy One, a high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I believe it was G. Campbell Morgan that said, We cannot organize revival, but we can set ourselves to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. We can't manufacture it. But when God blows it, we can just set themselves up and say, God, we're going with you. Amen. I ain't, we're not manufacturing anything around here. It has to be the work of God. And guess where it's going to start, church? It's going to start at the home. It's going to start there, Brother Randy. It, I'm going to turn this on just for a second, and then I'm going to say a few words, and then we're going to watch a little video. And then I want you to ask God to do a work in your heart. Do a work in your heart. The reason that we need revival in our church is not just for us that are older and our adults, but this revival future, if we don't see revival here, church, these little ones will never know what revival is about at all. See, let me just say this. There's many of you that's never been or seen a true move of God. And by the way, I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. It's actually a, a shameful thing that many of us have grown up in an atmosphere where you might have been in church your whole life, but yet you've not seen God move in a long, long time. And I'm not talking about just somebody walking the aisle and getting saved. I'm talking about something that you cannot explain. There's only been, in my short 30, almost 38 years, there's only been a few meetings that I've been in in my life where I said that was really the hand of Almighty God. 38 years. I remember one meeting was when my dad had evangelist Jimmy Clark, who's actually preached here on a Sunday. I love him very much. He's a good man. Jimmy Clark come and preached our revival for two weeks and multitudes of people got saved. I'll never forget it as long as I live. We were under an old tent and people kept coming to the altar and actually a, a woman who was a deacon's wife, uh, she came forward and she got saved that night. And man, that place just went, I mean, I can't explain it, but uh, she said, Preacher, can I get baptized? And Dad said, Well, ma'am, uh, you know, we're, we're down here in this tent and the, the baptistry's all the way up there and I don't think it's been heated. She said, I'll wait. And they waited till the baptistry got heated. It was after midnight. And let me just tell you, about half of the people that was in that meeting, I'm talking about three or 400 people in that tent, waited to see that deacon's wife get baptized. And the deacon got so excited after his wife got saved, he jumped into baptistry with her. He threw his, uh, he threw, I'll never forget it, he, Rick Miller took his wallet out as he's running to the baptistry, throws his wallet uh, just, and starts hollering and jumps in. I mean, it was, it, listen, I was just a little boy. I will never forget what God did that night. You say, oh, that's a little ridiculous. I believe the revival winds were blowing. I can't explain it. I can't explain what God did. One night, Jimmy Clark got up and he preached a message on a, a highway to hell is what he preached. My goodness, alive. He preached on hell that night and just folks were coming, weeping that night. It was just amazing. And then the next meeting I remember is just a few years ago, 2012, when a man by the name of Benny Beckham came to our church and Brother Beckham preached a two-week revival, but he only preached out of 13 nights. He preached four times. Four times. Can't explain it. But as he would preach, 
folks would come, or, or before he would preach, folks would come and flood the altars, and we called it a prayer revival. And let me tell you, when we start praying, things start happening. That's exactly what happened. Was folks were praying on a Saturday morning. My dad said, folks, I don't know about you, but uh, it was on a Friday night. He said, I'm going to open the church in the morning at 7 o'clock. And as many of you that would come and pray for revival, and I thought, 7 o'clock in the morning? You could not get a seat. 400 seat auditorium, it was jam packed. Little boys, little girls praying, moms and dads praying. You say, preacher, you saw that? I experienced it. Hey, for the very first time in my life, I'd been in a corporate prayer meeting where the Holy Ghost of God sat down in a place and things started happening. You say, when did that happen? In 1893? No, in 2012. Same God. We read about it, but often our faith, we just don't believe it. It was good for Charles Finney. It was good for D.L. Moody. It was good for Spurgeon. But come on, preacher, it's 2018. I mean, wake up. That God that did that stuff back then, He's not doing that today. That's what I'm talking about. If He can still save a sinner, He can still send revival. If He can still restore a home, He can still send revival. My friend, can I tell you, I've not given up hope. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? This revival future, I'm talking about these young men on this front row. How will they know? I'm talking about these kids over here. If we, church, if we don't see a revival, what's their future? How about the kids that's giving somebody holy terror right now in a room somewhere? You say, preacher, those kids, well, what about them? Yeah, what about them? If somebody don't preach the Word and pray the power of God down and believe that revival can happen, what about those kids? Church, can I tell you tonight, let's not give up on them. Our revival future rests on you. See, many churches believe that, oh, as long as the preacher's got the power of God, as long as the preacher preaches the Word, as long as the preacher's full of the Holy Spirit, as long as the preacher believes revival can happen, no, that ain't in the Scripture. He said, if my people, if my people which are called by my name, that has nothing to do with the man of God, that's the people. Now, it has a lot to do, hey, I'll be honest, I know a lot of pastors, I, there, matter of fact, I heard one say not too long ago, he doesn't believe that America can see revival anymore. I believe that it can I believe that God has allowed us a little space of grace in a very dark time, but I believe God can send revival. Hey, when you're limiting God to whatever, I'm not going to limit God to doing anything. He can do anything, and if God wants to send revival to America one more time, He certainly can use us. But I'm telling you, the future right here, sitting in this building, these teenagers and these young people, and these little ones, I still got little ones. Man, I don't want to give up. Brother Chad, y'all about to have a baby. Brother Joel, y'all just had a baby. Stephanie, y'all got a little baby. See, if we don't stay, if we don't stay dependent on God, then what about them? I mean, it's not just good for us. It, it's, it, we need to have a future revival. There needs to be a a place, can you just see what God has in store for this church? If He sends, Can you just see, every time I pull up on this property, I see things with my eyes. I'm like, man, there's something going to stand right there. There's something going to happen right there. There's something going to stand over there. Hey, that whole lot over there is going to be full of buses, and there's going to be a gym right there, and there's going to be a church right there. There may be a Bible college over there. Hey, you say, preacher, what do you see? I see a revival taking place right here in Simpsonville. By the power of God. Hey, there's been a lot of folks that's paved the way for this church just to be here right now. A lot of folks have paid the price that we owe a great debt. But hey, God's not done with this church. Matter of fact, He just could carry on and even take us to higher planes if folks start praying. If folks will start praying and believing God, having a hunger. Tonight, before we dismiss this revival now, don't pray about it for the future. Don't even say, Lord, if you see fit one day, send revival. No, let's be desperate and say, Lord, send it to us now. God, now. I'm talking about now. Lord, for our children. You say, well, my children's grown. Well, how about your grandchildren? 
Well, I don't have any grandchildren. Then how about the other people in here that's got children? How about investing in someone? How about praying? How about believing that we can have faith that God can send a revival? Brother Wes, if you get that ready, make sure the volume's adjusted and make sure it's loud enough so I want everybody to hear it. And then I want you to watch this and ask yourself the question, do I believe that revival can happen? And I look at the whole religious scene today, and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful, acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish, deep pain, deep sorrow, agony of God's heart. We've held on to our religious rhetoric and our revival talk, but we've become so passive all true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. You search the scripture and you'll find that when God determined to recover a ruined situation, He would share His own anguish for what God saw happening to His church and to His people and he would find a praying man and he would take that man and literally baptize him in anguish. You find it in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is in ruins. How is God going to deal with this? How is God going to restore the ruin? Now folks, look at me. Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was a career man. But this was a praying man. And God found a man who would not just have a flash of emotion, not just some great sudden burst of concern and then let it die. He said, no, I broke down and I wept and I mourned and I fasted. And then I began to pray night and day. Why didn't these other men, why didn't they have an answer? Why didn't God use them in restoration? Why didn't they have a word? Because there was no sign of anguish. No weeping. Not a word of prayer. It's all ruin. Does it matter to you today? Does it matter to you at all? That God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world? That there's such a coldness sweeping the land? Closer than that, does it matter about the Jerusalem that's in our own hearts? The sign of ruin that's slowly draining spiritual power and passion, blind to lukewarmness, blind to the mixture that's creeping in. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Let me ask you, is, is, is what I just said convicted you at all? There's a great difference between anguish and concern. Concern is something that you, the biggest interest you. You take an interest in a project or a cause or a concern or a need. I'm going to tell you something I've learned over all my years, 50 years of preaching. If it is not born in anguish, 
if it had not been born by the Holy Spirit, where when you saw and heard of the ruin, and it drove you to your knees, took you down into a baptism of anguish where you began to pray and seek God. I know now. Oh my God, do I know it. Until I'm in agony. Until I have been anguished over it. And all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do, where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing your heart, His heart with you. Your heart begins to cry out, Oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness and something has to be done. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let him once again break us. Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me. Don't tell me you're concerned when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Come on. Lord, there's some need to get this altar and confess. I am not what I was. I am not where I'm supposed to be. God, I don't have your heart or your burden. I've been I wanted it easy. I just want to be happy. But Lord, true joy comes. True joy comes out of anguish. There's nothing of the flesh will give you joy. I don't care how much money, I don't care what kind of new house there is. Absolutely nothing physical can give you joy. It's only what is accomplished by the Holy Spirit when you obey Him and take on His heart. And build the walls around your family. Build the walls around your own heart. Make you strong and impregnable against the enemy. God, that's what we desire. That's what you desire tonight. There's no need to give a, another message. You know good and well. I don't. I think I'm preaching to the best people in the in the world. But you know how serious you are about revival. You know how serious you are. Ask the Lord. Some of you. Maybe it's been a while since you prayed, you know, that God's merciful, He's gracious, He wants to hear your prayers. Maybe you just need to ask forgiveness, say, Lord, it's been a long time, but I want to hear your voice, I want to fellowship with you. He's able, He wants to spend time with you and me. Church, we can experience revival right now, right now. Let's quit playing games. Let's start thinking eternal. Let's start thinking eternal. Could you imagine what would happen to this church if everyone just lit that fire and said, God, do it now. Could you imagine what could happen here? I think we've seen a little glimpse of it, but folks, God's not done. Matter of fact, He's just started. Let's keep it going. I had a man walk out of church on... Wednesday night and he handed me a little package just a little thin looked like he wrapped it up in a Christmas he said preacher I got something for you and he handed it to me I opened it up inside that package was 93 index cards 93 on every index card was a specific prayer that we've been praying for that God has answered. 93 prayers since June that this man has prayed specifically for. And he said, Preacher, I want to give this to you. Not to boast. Matter of fact, I'm coming very humbly 
He almost asked me to forgive him for, he thought that maybe I thought it was more of a, but it was, and it humbled me as a pastor. I thought, man, this man's praying. Every Monday morning, I text this certain man a personalized need list that I have. Every Monday morning, he said, Preacher, I want a, and he's been doing this now for eight or nine months. He said, Preacher, I want to, I want to pray for your needs and your things that's on your heart. Ninety-three prayers answered. I didn't even, I wasn't keeping count. I, folks, imagine if we got that serious about prayer and we just said, God, I just believe that you just, that you're able. That you're able, that you're not just the God of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You're not just their God that did all that for them. You're the God of the now and the God of forever, Jude 25. Folks, we can see a great revival take place. I think this is perfect timing. I think that we're entering into a wonderful time that we can see God do some amazing, amazing things. Not, not too many churches this morning when they opened up their service had a packed house. I mean, we got to have church twice this morning. And the reason for that is God has sent the increase. God has sent the increase. What you see tonight has not been of man. It has been of the Lord Jesus. As long as we will go through life and go through this thing and say, God, you've done this by your power, by your might. You've done this. He will continue to bless His church and He'll continue to bless your family. I beg of you this year, be obedient to this right here. Please, please, be obedient to this right here. Pray, read your Bible, love God, raise your kids, raise them in this. Raise them in this. I mean, I'm telling you, my, my wife and I, we're about to pull our hair out. We don't know how to raise children. We really don't. I mean, we try. I mean, all I can remember is my wife, you know, she grew up in a divorced home. And, you know, I, I grew up in a wonderful home. Um, some of you wasn't privileged to grow up in a home like mine. There ain't a whole lot of excuses for me. I was raised right. I'm telling you, I need the help of God to raise these children. Oh, well, we're going to go through some rough patches. There's going to be some times where we wish we could give them away. There's been a few times recently. There's going to be some times when you're proud of them, man, your chest is about to explode. Just like my parents, there was times where they went through some rough, real rough patches. My teen years were rough. But hey, by God's grace, we made it. And by the way, by God's grace, you're going to make it. Right here. You can't improve on what's been tried and proven and alive. It's perfect. You can't, you can't. I told a young man back here in the counseling office here just today, Back here in his, he was telling me about some struggles and things, and he, and I said, "Man, get back to the basics. You're about to have a child, right here. If anything, be faithful to church. Be faithful to the things of God. Ask God to do a reviving now. Now, don't wait till you're married, teenagers. Don't wait till you're married. Don't wait till you're grown up. Ask God to do it now." Hey, don't wait till you're older and, well, when I get more established. I'll, no, do it now. God, please do a work in my heart now. A revival focus, a revival fellowship, and a revival future. He'll do it for you. He wants to. He wants to. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had in church tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you are God, that you are holy, that you're high and lifted up. Lord, we ask that you be with all the families that was not here today because of sickness and illness and death. There's some that are even, Lord, uh, having loved ones pass away as I speak. Lord, uh, 
I pray that you'd help us as a church to have revival this year. Send it, God, please. We're so desperate. I don't know if we've reached desperation yet, but in my heart, I'm, I want to see you do something. Lord, may we get desperate for it. We get faithful. Help us, God, please. Lord, I love you. I thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing at Bible Baptist Church. Thank you for the message we heard tonight. The message that was given to my heart. Lord, I uh, pray that you'd bless everything that is said and done. As we leave tonight, give us safety. Give us a good work week. May we resist temptation as we heard this morning. May we come back charged up, ready to go. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.